This is really a great opportunity to be here and to share with you our experience. And um, um, just the last 24 hours now, maybe, I don't know, 28 hours, 32 hours, have been so inspiring and have really um, got us both very excited about the things that we're going to take back to our organization from all the wonderful work that's being presented. Um, so yes, we work for Kaiser Permanente. Um, and by the way, I'm a living example of watchful waiting. Um, I have a case, I have a, a, a benign nodule in my thyroid gland and together with my endocrinologist have decided to just wait and watch and it's been 12 years and it hasn't changed in size. Uh, on the other hand, I just found out yesterday <laughs> that D actually had the same thing but it was a little bit more serious and he decided to take it out. So right here you have examples of one decision versus another based on the condition and uh, um, the, the preferences. Uh, as Don mentioned, our department uh, is at headquarters in Oakland, California, and we uh, work under the Quality and Service Division, and our job is to look for ways to apply technology to help improve uh, our quality performance, our service performance. Um, I get to go around looking for new technologies and innovations. Um, D helps me evaluate them. We bring them in, we try them, we test them. Uh, if they work, we, uh, we do our best to spread them across the organization. <clears throat> what we wanted to cover today are some pilot results from one of our regions. Uh, we have three regions that have embarked on this shared decision-making journey. Uh, and they're all testing the use of the uh, video decision aid by Health Dialog. Um, the Southern California region is uh, done with their pilot and the results are in. And um, they're favorable and Dee will get to talk about those. Uh, but in addition to that, <clears throat> or more importantly, we wanted to share with you some of the lessons, some of the ideas um, and challenges that we're facing as well as some of the freshly developed ideas in the last 32 hours based on everything we've heard uh, from all of you. And along the way, we're going to pose some provocative questions. Um, we would like to challenge some of the thinking um, and with your help, try to get some answers. Uh, but uh, we hope to, to, to get in a, in a very interactive conversation. Uh, so a little bit about Kaiser Permanente for those of you that uh, are not familiar with us, especially our European colleagues. Um, this slides give a high level overview of our organization. Um, and I am tempted and actually comfortable to change the first bullet to say we're the nation's largest nonprofit ACO. Because I think we have a, a lot of the elements that were mentioned in an ACO. <clears throat> we are an integrated healthcare organization, so we have a health plan, the hospitals, and the medical group, all part of one organization. Um, I just found out yesterday we're the size of Sweden. I had no idea that <laughs> Sweden's uh, population is nine millions. Most of these members are concentrated in California. About seven million of our members are in California, and the other two millions are spread across the other regions that are highlighted on this map. Uh, what's not mentioned up here, which I'd like to take a moment and uh, mention, is the fact that we're a prepaid model. Um, we're not a fee-for-service type model. And as such, we feel that one of our key success elements has been um, the alignment of, of the incentives that come with a prepaid model, keeping our patients and we don't like to call them patients. We, we, we purposely call them members because we like to keep them healthy. They become patients when they're not healthy and they come in and see us. Uh, but prevention is paramount and, and, and is at the core of what we do uh, and how we go about conducting the delivery of the care. Um, and I'm gonna touch on that a lot throughout our presentation. Some of the things I wanted to, you know, sound bites that I picked up from yesterday and this morning. And I just want to repeat these from 
several presentations and just have you hold on to these uh, sound bites as we go through some of the examples and some of the challenges uh, that we're working on. Um, right information at the right time. I think that came up in several conversations. Um, shared decision making cannot be just dropped in. How do you measure? How many times did we hear that over the last uh, 32 hours? What type of questions, knowledge versus perception, all of that. And somebody's got to be better off. I think it was Glenn that ended his presentation yesterday with that. And one of my goals today, as I told Glenn yesterday, is to take his confidence back to where it was before 10 years ago, maybe even higher, uh, based on, on, on some of the things that um, we think are possible. Um, and and uh, the one that struck me the most, and I kept coming back to it as I was reflecting on our work, is you know, shared decision making is truly about getting at what is most important to the patient. We can't lose sight of that, um, each individual. So with that, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about why or, or where our journey at Kaiser has started. Um, for us, it was all about patient engagement from day one. Shared decision making concept, um, I think started about, I wanna say three to four years ago. And it was really triggered by our cousin organization up in the Northwest, Group Health, and I think some of you are familiar with Group Health. We have a close affiliation with their work and they uh, took on shared decision making a while back and uh, we quickly were interested and they got our attention and uh, we decided to get into this shared decision making space. Uh, but for us, you know, we like to keep it under this bigger umbrella of the patient engagement continuum. So the first challenge or question that I'm gonna pose here is rather than think of shared decision making when a condition is present, why not think of it from day one uh, when you're meeting the member, not the patient, and um, are talking about how to stay healthy? Why not uh, think of it as a conversation that begins to get at what is most important to that patient? before they develop a, con a condition. Remember, prevention is very important in our organization. And some of our efforts right now, driven by technology and driven by our <clears throat> uh, medical record system, the electronic medical record system, are trying to get at that. So some examples I wanna give you about what we've been able to do with the technology, just to give you a sense of how now six to seven years post-implementation, and I have to tell you, I'll be the first to admit that we're still struggling and, and, and with proficiency and accuracy and making sure that everybody's using uh, the electronic technology um, as well as they could. I would say personally that um, if, if you take all of our users across the organization, we're about 60 to 70% proficient. We still have about 30 to 40 people to bring along. Nevertheless, here are some of the things that we've been able to do now that we're becoming more proficient with the technology. So when you think about patient engagement, let's start with, with some of the things that we've done on the patient side. <clears throat> um, care plans. I know in some of the conversations I had yesterday, um, that is, that's our vision. That's where we'd like to go. That's what we have started working on. We have two regions already developing an electronic way for patients to enter the preferences as soon as they join Kaiser. So think of it as a, a, like the, the bank that you join or an investment firm and you try to develop your uh, risk profile, what types of investments you would like to make. I like to think of it the same way. You're joining our organization. What kind of a lifestyle do you have? What are your preferences? What are your values? That becomes the central point that both the member and the physician have access to on this electronic record. We think of it as a continuum. The preferences are gonna change over time. You could be young and healthy today and your goals are this list, 
10 years from now, you could be faced with a condition and your goals are gonna change, your preferences are gonna change. It is good to engage with the, with the member when they join and they have some place where they can go and have access to update this information and for that information to flow directly to the provider's record and they can see it in every care setting. One of the advantages that we have, you know, the, the, the integration in our care setting, no matter where you end up, whether it's the emergency room, the, the lab, the primary care physician's office, or in a specialty um, uh, clinic, it's the same record. Everybody has access to this care plan. Everybody can see the patient's preferences at that moment. So care plans is a huge area that we're working on. It's challenging. We're not there yet. We don't have the answers, but we're going there. And, and we know it's very important. Patient reported outcomes. We heard a lot about that yesterday. We're already testing that, and we have clinics now that are using questionnaires, um, whether it's the chemo suites where you're sitting there for an hour and you're getting the treatment uh, and you have a, an iPad that you can enter information on to, uh, in real time, deliver what you're experiencing as a result of this treatment. And that information is fed directly back to the physician so that they can maybe adjust the treatment based on the feedback that they're getting. Um, Emails, um, I mean, this has been the number one um, used feature on our patient portal, which we call kp.org, emailing my doctor. We are now at 47% remote care. So when you consider all the patient touches across our organization, office visits is about 53%, and emails and telephone visits are about 47%. Group health is ahead of us. They're at 60% in remote care. A lot of patients would much rather have a phone visit or an email rather than take time off work, get in the car, go to a waiting room, sit in the waiting room with other sick people, um, you know, talk about where the puck is going. I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's that PDA that's, that's where, where everything's going. Um, on the provider side, this technology has enabled same day access with a specialist. Um, 15 years ago when I joined Kaiser, we were looking at 30 day access as the goal. How can we get 30 day access to a specialist? It got down to 14, we got it down to seven. We now have same day access to a specialist thanks to the ability of a primary care physician who's seeing a patient do a video consult with a specialist while the patient is there, and you can have a three-way conversation and address any concerns or questions that, that the patient has. Um, care gaps on the provider side, everybody on the team can now look up the care gaps. We have stories from receptionists who truly believe and they actually are saving lives because they can see that someone is overdue for a mammogram or a pap and they get to know this person and somehow they get to convince them that it's really important to get that done. And we have stories where patients have gone back to these people and thanked them because something was found um, and they were able to treat it early. Why don't we shift to our pilots and talk about uh, the experience that we had in Southern California and then maybe we can open it up for questions after that. Okay, uh, I'm gonna uh, share some uh, our pilot results and our lesson learned and what process we go. And uh, uh, here to, I have to say we have, uh, I'm not bring any uh, new idea or even solution here to, uh, to the table, but even more questions. And in the past day and half, and we have learned a lot of challenges around, among all the practices and, and research. And we are experiencing pretty much the same thing. Um, but the, uh, a, uh, a lot of things happened in, in, the, in this uh, past year, and we run a pilot. And Sarah showed the, the, uh, the process list. I wish that we had it, everything checked out before we really start the pilot. But Here's uh, some summaries that we experienced. Uh, the pilot really starts from uh, January to September last year. We worked with the Health Dialogue, and the basic idea we're trying to 
to, to think is we, we have all these studies before. We check the literature and the other experience and research results. And we think how we can implement this in the real world for an organization like us. We had pretty much everything. We think we probably have the best chance to make this work. And um, so we try to design some measurements in a, uh, to see the impact of a shared decision making on our population. And the, um, here's are some, something we'll go along, I'll talk about this, uh, in detail. So the pilot mostly focuses on two areas, ortho and uh, urology. We, we check the uh, uh, osteoarthritis, knee and, uh, hip and knee, and uh, prostate cancer. Focusing on four areas that we're trying to measure, see how this thing can be successfully com uh, implemented. One is we try and track usage because that's a starting point. We're trying to cover everybody that qualified for pref as a preference, preference sensitive care and uh, for the condition. In the patient's experience, we're trying to understand how they experienced it during the whole process and their decision making. I mean, I think there are a lot of ex uh, familiar experience here for everybody. I'm not going to go through all the details, but we can see the results later on. And uh, clinician's experience, we had a good idea of design, but the result didn't come up so well because we don't have many physicians really participated in our survey. And utilization, for an organization like us really to, even though we're non-for-profit organizations, but really the organization point of view and the leadership really kind of want an understanding of the impact on utilizations. So here we use the surgical yields as our measurement to see how the uh, hip and knee replacement and the uh, surgical intervention for the prostate cancer. All right, so the, uh, as we thought, I thought, I mean, at least my job is trying to give it the best result to come out some sort of a firm conclusions how this thing really impacted us. And we had a, for whatever reasons, a lot of reasons, we can't conduct a randomized control trial, but we're trying our best methodology to conduct a ritual study and the things that we think, one good thing, we have a pretty big patient volume. Eventually we're going to get enough analytical power to really conduct an analysis. But really, we first thing we faced in a couple of months into the process, we really the challenge is to, like Sarah illustrated earlier, that it just is so hard to get this thing through the, all the way to workflow to get to the patient, to make them view in the videos and come back to talk about and have a consultation. So here's our distribution rate, eventually after nine months. And um, the actual videos are sent out more than this, but the, uh, some of them are sent to not the qualified patients by whatever the uh, physician's criteria. So you can see there are some Immediately, this is going to impact the operations itself and also impact my analysis, right? Because you see different criteria, variations, and uh, the selection bias kick in right away. So the rea reality really is pretty hard on us. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details about methodologies and everything. And here we're trying to be as best uh, as as possible that we can do it. So we're trying to use our, because we have many medical centers, Kaiser has a, a many, many hospitals. We have pretty much now like what, 36 hospitals. And um, so one thing we use to trying to do a historical control, another one is trying to concurrent, trying to use some propensity score and create a kind of a quasi experiment study, make it more valid. And um, Here's some methodology if you're interested in it goes through. Oh, uh, and uh, some variables we be able to control for us, like age genders, and we use some risk scoring and uh, comorbidities. And for different conditions, we use the BMI and Gleason score. And also because the provider situation, different experience, we're trying to control for providers too. Here's some of the uh, Result for utilization. I want to present the utilization first, and then we go down to the next few slides for the uh, surveys we designed for a patient experience and the provider experience. 
this is Anagesa data for the uh, historical control group. This is the uh, uh, three conditions. The, the, the yellow bar shows the, uh, the baseline and uh, the, uh, well, that's kind of a blue or purple showing the, the, uh, the post for the, the, the similar pilot sites. And first, KP, I mean Kaiser Permanente, it's all, we, our surgical yield rate, it yields, it's, uh, for all the conditions, pretty much lower than the, the other institutions, just by the nature of our uh, practice. And, uh, and notice here is also in the past couple of years, because of uh, different other interventions, confounding with this, is already see the trends going down. And with a limited sample size, here's our results. And nothing, I mean, most of them are not really uh, anything statistically significant. And even though the, the hip replacement shown some significance, but the sample size is really small, very sensitive to confounders and chance and all that. And also this is the unadjusted data for the uh, comparing in the uh, uh, SDM pilot sites versus non-SDM sites, the other medical centers. And uh, just by picking and uh, from our physician specialty group and realize that the uh, pilot sites are the uh, among the highest surgical yields uh, medical centers. So on the right side of the blue showing the pilot sites, their, their surgical yields is higher than the rest of them, the, the region. So here's the concurrent control with the same time period for the pilot, during the pilot uh, time. And uh, we do, like the uh, historical control method, we do see some reduction, but nothing significant statistically. And the urology actually going up and the prostate cancer surgical yield. And, um, but we do see some directional association, so that's kind of a caught the attention of our leadership and analytical uh, society. So that gave us a one chance really trying to, we're gonna focus in on certain areas, especially like a hip replacement, to see if we can further follow on and um, uh, the same uh, uh, decision aid with health dialogue and to see the uh, results down the, the, uh, uh, down the road. So I'm gonna quick go through the limitations. Obviously, we didn't get the enough analytical power. It was a very small sample size. And a, one big thing I wanna emphasize is the workflow, workflow, like Don already mentioned. It's just, just so hard. And uh, not only will you put in the workflow in place, also, you have to standardize the workflow to make sure that you can really compare and really analyze them. And the variations in there and the criteria in the mind of the physicians to select their patients so he's gonna prescribe the, the decision aids is so, such a, so varied among all of them and you, it's, it's really hard to analyze them. So beyond the analy uh, analytics and everything to straight up the, the streamline the, all the processes is the first and the must. That's what, uh, what we learned. Okay, now we want to go quickly go down to the, uh, uh, the patient survey and uh, the clinician survey trying to get. This is pretty much followed everything I've read, already done by most many of you in this group. And we work with, the, with Health Dialogue to design some simple questions and um, actually we can implement in the real world to get patients, not get them a fatigue and also can get meaningful use information out. So this focus on it in the area of patient knowledge to see if they have any uh, improvement. And second is to see their perceptions of, of, uh, of uh, uh, their trend, feel about their knowledge gain. And also to design to see if they have any ex, uh, feelings about the experience the whole process and how the decision aids help them making a decision. Here are some of the results. So my question is, is this patients or the questions? We got mixed results coming down the road. And I can't remember who said they started. The patients don't know what they don't know. And uh, on the left-hand side of the bar is saying the, uh, the, uh, what they know about the correct answer to these two questions. And they're on the right is the post time period when we test 
them. These are not the same population, but we use the, these are all, but they are all uh, same uh, condition and the same qualification, same criteria patients. One is before the pilot's population. The other ones are the uh, people who had a uh, view the videos during the pilots. Here's for the ortho, ortho conditions. In the next page, this is for the prostate cancer uh, patients, their answer about the two knowledge questions. And you can see here they have uh, some knowledge improvement, but not the, in the ortho, ortho department. Here, this page is showing the, the perception of the, their feeling about knowing their conditions, the risk, benefits, and, and their treatment choices. Obviously, this is look much better. They feel like they know everything pretty much. Okay, here's also we have the question just for the post to ask them to grade the, the decision aids. It's just, just, this surprised me. I, I don't know if it surprised anybody else, but it's overwhelmingly positive. They feel like, oh, this helped me a lot. And we do have another slide, but we, I didn't show here. They did show before they had the decision aid, they go all over the place, the internet or other medical website to see information. But once they have the, the decision aid with them, the other sides are going down and the decision aid is going up. So here's another slide that we checked with also the pre and post the pilot to see how the decision being made. And for the pre pilot, that population, the blue one shown the uh, the a, and B, a plus B is a solely made by the patients. And you see the big jump in the post pilot. And the overall bar showing the, uh, the joint decision made. It was A plus B plus C. It's just me or my doctor and I made all together. Um, so it is an improvement, at least from what the patient feel about. Also, we did a provider survey, uh, how they feel we had a qu uh, um, few questions about them, how they feel, and also towards their patients about their resource uses. Uh, I don't quite get really what the reason behind it is. Um, one thing I guess is, is, is we have a small uh, group of uh, physicians constantly before and after the pilot really join our, uh, participate in our survey. So our results kind of like very similar in before and after, except for a couple of things uh, pop out. So here's one of uh, example. It, it's a, a make them feel, does feel like they explore the individual value more than before. And uh, they feel like the patients after viewing the video do equipped with more knowledge is coming into to talk to, about them for the uh, follow-up consultation. So a, 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 I can't say there was anything conclusive. We just feel like it might have the right direction to go and the patient does feel um, a lot better with the, the decision aids. So it is for, from their perception of, of uh, the uh, experience. So layout, I can't provide any answer. It's just a lot of questions, but it's just some observations we implemented in the real world, and um, we probably have a further work to do down the road in the next year or two. Okay, now I'll turn back to Al. So, um, despite these mixed results, which still are in the right direction, um, I think if you remember the earlier slide, we did not set out to test whether you know SDM is a good thing to do. We kind of knew that this is something that's been demonstrated over and over and over uh, to have many benefits. It was m more about whether or how to make it work in our system. And some of the key lessons and uh, takeaways from this pilot, uh, workflow, workflow, workflow. I'm looking at, at the three bullets and I should have put that third bullet on top because I would, again, submit to you that um, with the right workflows and automation, you can actually change the culture. I don't think you can change the culture and then bring the workflows to support it. That might be harder. Uh, in our case, if we can get the right workflow in place, and that's for both the provider side as well as for the patient, if we give patients the ability to access the information and to uh, uh, get their questions answered the right time, the right place, I think uh, everything else follows. 
So uh, for us, we took a lot from a lot of lessons from these pilots, as well as from the group health experience. Um, we're already looking at ways to automate the process so that a provider can, with two clicks, order the video. The link can go in a secure message or in an email, or it could be on the after visit summary that the patient will have access to. Um, uh, we also have a workflow where the MA who's rooming the patient when they come back asks a couple of questions, whether you saw the video, did you watch the whole thing, what did you think, quickly, just you know, within 30 seconds, capture and document whether they viewed the video and then um, and, 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 and we can track that over time. So, uh, so we continue to, to learn and to improve these workflows, hoping that we can spread this more widely. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of interest across the organization already, just based on these preliminary results, as well as the two other regions that are working on this, Colorado and Northern California. And now we have um, all of our regions coming together later this September to start thinking about an organization-wide uh, implementation process. So that's, that's the future direction. That's where we hope to go. And I do want to stop and open it up because I know we're running out of time.